And as far as our format goes, um, we have a few people who identify themselves who will kind of remain with their mics open to laugh at the jokes and give Joel a little bit of feedback. But if everyone else could keep their mic off as kind of the, the default. Um, if you have questions, you feel free to post them in the chat. BK is going to read off uh, good questions from the, the chat for Joel. And uh, we can always, you know, interject intermittently, but just kind of the default, leave your camera off. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Joel David Hamkins. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for uh, having me here. It's really a great pleasure to come and talk math with all of, uh, with all of you. That, uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I have my slides. Let's see. I uh, hope that's the one. Um, OK, let me just maximize that. So I hope everyone can see that. Um, also, I would I'd like to um, just reiterate that I'm totally happy to have any kind of questions. So if you have any questions, just either ask it or put it in the chat so that it can be asked. Uh, and I would really love to have um, uh, any kind of question during the talk. So if there's anything that's confusing or if you have a comment to make or if you want to pick a fight with me or something, then that's totally great. So I would, I'm totally open uh, to that. Please jump in. Okay. So this is joint work with a number of people. So Corey Evans uh, was my first main partner in this infinite chess stuff. He was a PhD student in philosophy at the City University of New York when I was in New York. Um, and also he was a, a prominent chess player. In fact, when he was five years old, he was the US national champion for five-year-olds, which is actually quite an impressive achievement. And so it's really good to have a, an actual chess player as a partner when you're writing about infinite chess because my own chess skills are not so considerable. Uh, I'm a pretty average player, but uh, Corey really kept me on my toes and was, uh, that was really great. Also Dan Brumlevy, who I've never met, but I interacted with him on Math Overflow uh, in an important way. Philip Schlicht is in Bristol. Norman Perlmutter was one of my PhD students at the Graduate Center, and so all of these are co-authors on the paper. Okay. So I want to start with some puzzles uh, that came from the from IBM from a kind of puzzle challenge. And so this is a kind of warming up to infinite chess. So we're going to play on an infinite chess board. So there's no edge. The board goes forever in all four directions. And we're going to play with some funny rules, namely white gets to put any number of queens down on the board. And then black can place his king anywhere he wants as long as it's not in check. Uh, and then the play proceeds from that position. And so the question is, how many queens do you need uh, to ensure checkmate? So if somebody has an answer to that, please post it in the chat or go ahead and say it. How many queens do you need uh, so that you can definitely checkmate the black king, even though you won't know it? So for example, maybe this number of queens is maybe sufficient. Um, so I can't tell, let's see, I guess I should look at the chat, so. Uh, and Joel, is the question, so that it's immediate or so that after no, play? So that after play, you can guarantee checkmate in a few moves or in some finite number of moves. So the question is, how many queens do you need to guarantee that you will be able to make checkmate? And a lot of times people say three queens because they have the idea that, well, you can sort of use one queen to kind of guard a whole row here, right? Uh, and then you could maybe have another queen to, to, to uh, block another row. And then the king would be trapped between those two rows. And then with a third queen, you could just come right in the middle. So three queens seem to be sufficient. But in fact, you can do it with two. And so the right answer is two. Um, and the way you can do it is, first of all, you can trap the black king, say, in two, uh, in, in two files between, um, uh, uh, between the, the two white queens. And then if you, if you move your queen, a rook's, not, a rook's move away, then the king will have to move away. And then you can move this one up, a rook's move away. And the black king now has only one move. And then you can make checkmate like this. So this is checkmate, it's checking, and there's no place for the, for the black king to go. So with two queens, you can win that game. But then, of course, the next puzzle is to do the same thing with rooks. So how many rooks 
you need to put down so that if black puts the black king wherever he or she wants, then the, the white player will be able to eventually make checkmate. And, and here you can see, certainly if you have three rooks, then you can do that original idea. So you can trap the black king between two of the rooks and then you can enter into that in-between place that delivers check and it's checkmate because the black king has no place to go. Um, so three rooks are sufficient and then you have to think about whether two are good enough because of course on, on a finite board, on any finite chess board, two rooks are sufficient because you can, it's one of the most famous elementary checkmates that you learn when you're first learning chess is this sort of ladder checkmate with the rooks. You, you drive the king against one of the walls. But in infinite chess, there is no edge. There's no wall to drive the king towards. And so if all you have is two rooks, in fact, you cannot even set up a checkmate position that you're driving for. There is no checkmate position with only two rooks versus a king. And therefore, um, uh, so for example, with these positions, we don't have any white king. If we had a white king, it would be a different situation because the white king uh, would in effect form a kind of wall that you could uh, that you could use. Okay, so now we can ask the same question with bishops. So how many bishops do you need in order so that if you put your bishops down, then no matter where the black king goes, you can force a checkmate. I'm, I haven't really thought about this. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess four because the answer the first answer was two and the second answer was three. And I'm okay, just gonna that's duck. good. Yeah, numerology. Okay, very good. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so if you have four, then for example, do you want do you want two light square bishops and two dark square bishops, or how do you want to put them? Oh. Probably an even split. I mean, I definitely don't want them all on the on the white squares for yeah. sure. If they were all on the white squares, then it wouldn't work because right. the black king could just stay on the black squares, and there there's no way that you could ever make checkmate then, right? And so, so it seems like you need some bishops on each of the colors and, uh, and, and in fact, six suffice. And the way that you can do it with six is you can use them in pairs. So if I use these two here, can you all see my mouse here? I guess you can, yeah. right? Um, so these two bishops here make a kind of diagonal wall, right? And these two over here make another kind of diagonal wall. And then I can kind of, push those two diagonals, you know, I can pince them together and trap the black king between those. Um, but if I do that, I won't be able to make checkmate with just those four. So if you think about it, so th this is going to two pairs. So, so what I need is two more, one on each color, so that whichever diagonal the king gets trapped on between those two walls, then the right color bishop is going to come in and make checkmate on that diagonal, kill that whole diagonal at once. And that will make checkmate. But the thing is, if you only have five, then you're going to be stuck in that situation of not enough on one of the colors. Because if you have five bishops only, then you're going to have at most, you know, it'll be like two and three or one and four. So one of the colors is going to have at most two, um, two bishops. And, uh, and if there's only two bishops on a color, then in fact, the king can always run away. If the king just stays on that color that has only two bishops, then if you think about it, there's always going to be a move to, to go away because the only way all four moves, like if the black king is here and, and suppose there were only two black bishops, two black square bishops, two dark square bishops, I mean, um, then the only way all four of those moves could be blocked is if the king was already twice in check, but that situation cannot arise because then what was the previous move like? The, the, there was a checking move, but the king was already in check by the other bishop. So therefore, it can't be the case that uh, um, uh, that all four are blocked, and therefore the king, with only five bishops, the king will always have a free move by staying on one of the colors only. Okay, so now if we think about knights, uh, the same question. I want to put a whole bunch of knights down. Maybe this isn't enough. Let me just take it, take a thousand knights, put them down wherever you want. And then the opponent puts the king down, maybe some distance away. And then the question is, can you, can you, you know, organize your 
your army here of knights so as to maybe surround the king and maybe deliver checkmate. Um, and, and the answer, <clears throat> very surprisingly, well, does anyone have an answer to this? Let's see from the chat, it seems like a couple of people suggest maybe the knights are not quite fast enough uh -huh. to get over there. Good. Very good. So that's exactly right because for example, if we look at this army here, it's not enough because if, suppose we deliver check, then the king has to go and then we could deliver check again and then the king can just run away and then check again, say, and the king runs away. Okay, now uh, we can't quite get to check, but maybe we can still hope to surround the king. And the point is that if the king is totally on one side of the army of knights and just runs away, then the king is moving one square per turn. But each knight can move basically in the horizontal component at most two. But if you only have one knight, okay, with one knight, you can catch up to the king. But you can't checkmate the king with only one knight. And so even with two knights, you can't really do it. But even with two knights, then you're, you're traveling on average the same speed as the king because the king is going one square per turn. And with two knights each going two turn, two squares per turn, then on average that's one square per turn. So it's going to take you at least three knights to get uh, any chance of of checkmating, and uh, it's just not fast enough, as the as I said in the chat. That's exactly right. Okay, so the king can just run away, no matter how many knights there are, any finite number. Of course, if you say infinitely many knights, then you can do it because you could fill up all the squares except for you know except for one or a few so that it was legal for the king to go in there and then deliver checkmate because there wasn't there weren't any squares left for the for the black okay so we had a Joel, we had a question earlier about sure. stalemates right so and there's the in the question? finite board there's like a an option where like some kind of cyclical thing is the end is there is right. there something analogous we have to define for the infinite board? Yes. so i'm going to get to that what are the rules of infinite chess and we don't have the stalemate rule because we allow infinite play anyways which counts as a stalemate and so the way it works in infinite chess is that we give up many of those tournament rules really the the sort of threefold repetition rule is a kind of proxy for infinite play that's how i think about it it's not a real rule it's just because it would be boring to actually play all infinitely many moves, but in infinite chess, in any infinite play, even if it's not repeating, counts as a draw. And uh, and so we give up that, that four stalemate rule. Also, we don't have any pawn promotion in infinite chess because there's no edge, and we don't have en passant, and we don't have the, the 50 move rule that's common in tournament play where by which if there's 50 moves without a capture or a pawn movement, then the, it counts as a stalemate because the infinite chess games that we play are very, very long often, and they it would go afoul of that 50 move rule. I view all of those rules as kind of, uh, well, some of those rules as kind of conveniences for pr the practicality of running a chess tournament because you can't let it go forever and so on. Um, and so the infinite chess uh, rules are slightly different. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit more abstractly about what what is a game? And, uh, and one answer that you might give to this is that a, the essential information about any game is completely captured by what's called the game tree. And the game tree is the tree of all possible um, positions that the game that you might find yourself in after playing moves in the game. So I've drawn here part of the game tree for tic-tac-toe. So we start with the empty position where neither player has yet made any move. And of course there's nine possible moves for X to put the X. I don't know if you can see this, it's very small. I'm sorry if it's not quite visible. Uh, X has nine possible first moves. And so for example, maybe the player chose this move. And after each one of those moves, uh, there are eight possible replies. So I've only drawn the possible replies for, uh, for this move. Because the, the actual tic-tac-toe tree is enormous with tens of thousands of, uh, of nodes in it. Um, so after that first move, then there's eight possible replies for O, and maybe O put, a, o, put the O up in the upper right corner. And then after that, there would be seven possible moves for X and, and so on. And so we can consider the entire game tree. And maybe eventually one gets to a position such as this one, where there's a tic-tac-toe, X has won this particular play of the game. So, so a game is the whole tree, the, the whole space of possible moves. 
And a play of the game is basically a path through that tree choosing particular moves at each step. So in this particular game, um, uh, O played very badly here on the first move because X was able to uh, was able to play here, which is threatening tic-tac-toe. So O had to block that one, but then X could play in the middle, which sets up a double tic-tac-toe threat. And so no matter, so O chose to block one of them, but then X could make the, the other tic-tac-toe. So this first move by O was a bad move because in fact, uh, tic-tac-toe is a drawn game. Uh, but after this move, it wasn't a drawn game anymore. X could force the win. Okay. So what is a strategy in a game? I have another game tree here. This is a very simple game. We start at this node here, and then Alice makes a choice about which way to go. And then after making that choice, Bob chooses which way to go. And then after that choice, Alice makes the final move. And the winner is indicated in the bottom here. So for example, Bob would really love to be at this node uh, because then no matter what Alice does, Bob is going to win. So this is a really good move for a really good place for Bob to be. So the question is, uh, what, what is a strategy? Well, a strategy is a function that tells you what to do uh, when it's your turn in the game tree. So it's a function that it, for each node in the game tree tells the, that player which move to make from that position. And then the other player can do whatever they want. And then the strategy tells the given player what, which move to make. So for example, what if, what if there are uh, two good moves? Yeah, if there are I two, mean, then, yeah. So then it's called, it, the strategy might just pick one of them if it's a strategy. And, and uh, because I said it's a function, but there's another concept which is called a winning policy. So at each node, you have a, a set, maybe a, a, a set of size larger than one element of, of good moves for you. So, so, so a winning strategy is a strategy so that if you play according to that strategy, then you will find inevitably that you have won the game. And a winning policy is just like that, except every, every play according, that accords with the policy is a win for that player. Uh, so there's issues with the axiom of choice and so on about the difference between a winning policy and a winning strategy, but I thought I wouldn't get into that necessarily. So, okay, so the strategy is winning. So can anyone tell me uh, who is going to win this game? What should Alice do? Or maybe there's nothing she Allison. can do. What's that? I think Alice has a winning strategy. Yeah. And what is Alice going to do? I think that's Aaron, right? Yeah, it's Aaron. Uh, I think she should take go to the right. If Alice goes this way, then suppose Bob goes this way, then Alice can win. But suppose Bob went this way, then Alice can still win. So therefore, if Alice goes here, then no matter what Bob does, Alice can still win. So that's a winning strategy. Uh, Alice definitely shouldn't go here because then, as we said, it's going to be Bob's turn and Bob can go here, which we already said is a good place for Bob to be because now whatever Alice does, Bob is going to win. So I think that's the only winning strategy is for Alice to go this way on the first move and then Bob can freely choose and then Alice should choose the winning circle on me. Okay, it's a fundamental theorem, the fundamental theorem of finite games proved by Zermelo, the same, the same Zermelo as in set theory. And he proved that every finite game has a winning strategy for one of the players. So whenever you have a finite game, I mean a game for which the whole game tree is finite, uh, then one of the players can win. And it's, there's, a, there's a number of different ways to prove this theorem. I think I know at least three or four different proofs of it, but maybe one of the easiest is this back propagation through the game tree. So if you have the finite game tree and the terminal nodes are labeled with the winner, then you can date do that kind of analysis that we just did here. Bob likes this node because if Bob can get there, then Bob will win regardless of what Alice does. So we can label this node with Bob, but therefore we can also label this node with Bob because if play gets there, Bob, Bob would love to be here because then Bob can choose this one. So we can propagate uh, this kind of labeling backwards from the bottom, depending on who would like to get to that node. Um, and, and ultimately we'll put somebody's name on every node and this is how it will be. So these nodes will be labeled Bob because if, if play somehow got to this node, Bob would win. And uh, 
and, and the labels propagate all the way to the top. And then the winning strategy is just uh, whoever's name is on the starting position has a winning strategy. And the winning strategy is just stay on nodes with your label. And uh, this node was labeled Alice because it's her turn and she could go to a node labeled Alice. This node was labeled Alice because it's Bob's turn. Oops because it's Bob's turn and no matter what Bob does, he's gonna be in an Alice node. And these nodes are labeled Alice because it's Alice's turn from each of them and she has a, a winning move from them. So that's the back propagation method and you can use it to prove that in any finite game, exactly one of the players has a winning strategy. They can't both have winning strategies because, who can explain that? You only put one label on the top cell? Well, that's true, but that's having to do with the proof of the existence of a winning strategy rather than with the fact. I mean, maybe there's some other argument that would put Bob you, there or something. You play one against the other. Yes. They can't both have winning strategies because you could play those strategies against each other and they would have to both win, but there's no way to have both players win because every terminal node has exactly one winner. So when we have a game tree, the terminal nodes are labeled with just one winner. Now, so Joel, okay, Joel, well then, I think we have two questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, one, I think they're both about applying this to tic-tac-toe. So we have to, right. is there okay. something in there about no ties? And then yes. the other one was in tic-tac-toe, you can get to the same board drawing on yes. different branches of that, which would make, if we identify those vertices, would no longer be a tree. So just yes. clarifying how we're thinking okay, about sure. both of those. So let me address the, the second one first. So when we say the game tree, then we're not just talking about pictures of the, of the board of the game. The game tree remembers the whole history of how you got there, and that's why it's a tree. So, so we really mean the game tree, which includes, and it's important in chess, because if you just see the chess board, then you don't actually even know whose turn it is because you can get to that same picture, that same snapshot of the chessboard in a variety of ways. And on some of the ways, maybe it's White's turn and on some of the ways, maybe it's Black's turn. And also in chess, for example, you can't tell whether or not uh, the, the, the king and rook have moved already or, or not. And so you can't tell whether castling is still allowed and so on. So you have to know the history and also for the threefold repetition, it's also part of it. You have to know the history of the play of how you got there. So when I say a position, I mean the entire history of the play that got to there. I don't just mean what the board looks like. Now for the first question for draws, of course, that's very important with tic-tac-toe and also with chess because there's uh, games with draws and Zermelo's main focus actually in that 1913 paper was on chess, but the situation is very similar for tic-tac-toe. And what he proved also is that in any finite game that has draws or stalemates, then either one of the players has a winning strategy or else both players have drawing strategy. So in particular, it follows that in chess, and I'm talking about finite chess here, regular eight by eight chess, either white or black has a winning strategy or else both of them have forcing draw strategy. And, and this follows from the other theorem. Uh, you, can, you can derive it as a consequence. This theorem you can derive as a consequence of the other one. If, for example, you just temporarily think of a draw as a win for white, then one of the players can win that modified game and, and, and similarly with black. And you can use that kind of analysis and it just falls out. Okay, so what I'd really like to do though is generalize to infinite games. So that fundamental theorem was about finite games. And now the winning condition is specified by a fixed winning set of plays. Okay, I'm, I'm recognizing that there's no way we're gonna get through everything that I have in the slide, so that's no problem. We can just talk about what, uh, uh, we'll definitely get to more infinite chess. Okay. So let's imagine that we have players that you and I together are going to play zero and one, and we're gonna build an infinite binary string, an infinite binary sequence of zeros and ones. And let's suppose that white wins if the sequence is eventually periodic. Okay. So maybe you're, the, you're white and, uh, and I'm black and we're playing zeros and ones together and uh, 
and you're going to win if the sequence is eventually repeating not i don't mean repeating digit by digit but it, eventually there's a block that repeats over and over again. so who wins that game who can win that game so this is a different kind of game because you don't win at a finite stage it's about the infinite game the infinite play whether that infinite play has a certain feature So can anyone say who wins that game? So I claim that the opponent, that black can win this game because black is trying to make it not periodic, not even eventually periodic. So if, but black controls half the moves. So if black plays, Black is playing on all the odd positions, right? So if black just plays a non-periodic, a non-eventually periodic sequence on those digits and just ignore white's move, then the whole thing can't be eventually periodic because it's not even periodic on the, on the odd digits. So if black just plays 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, zero one 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 and so on and and just does something like that it's not periodic then uh regardless of what white did in between there's no way to make that overall sequence eventually periodic and so black can force the, the play out of this set okay so here's some other ones maybe we won't talk so much about this but for example maybe white wins if the sequence is universal in the sense that it contains all finite strings so this this is not a win. White can't win that game because black could just play zero every time. So every other digit is going to be zero. And there's no way that is going to be universal then. The, whatever white did, you're never going to have, say, you know, one, one, one. That string won't appear if, if every other digit is zero. Here's one that you can think about later. C is the set of infinite strings that either contain zero, zero, or one, 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 but they don't contain this one. So one needs to think about who can, who can force that property or force the negation of that property. Okay, so an open game, this is a generalization of the concept of finite game. An open game is an infinite game where it's open for a player, say white, if every win for that player is achieved at some finite stage so that the winning condition is known already. So chess, infinite chess is like that because when you win infinite chess, it's because you made checkmate and that happened at a particular move in the game. It didn't take infinitely many moves to make checkmate. The only way to win infinite chess is to make checkmate and that happens at some finite stage. So that's an open game. And then it's a theorem. This is a kind of generalization of Zermelo's theorem. Uh, every open game has, one of the players has a winning strategy. And there's an analogous thing if there's draws and so on at a finite stage. And you can prove this theorem using this very interesting idea of ordinal game values. So we are going to measure, uh, we're going to put an ordinal, associate an ordinal with every position in the game tree. The game tree is vast, right? Because it's in, we're talking about infinite games now. Um, but we're going to, for every position in that game tree, we're going to attach an ordinal, which is going to measure the distance to a win for the open player. Okay, there's a typo here, it should say mate in N. So in chess, we have this concept of, you know, a problem like a mate in two problem or mate in three or mate in N for some N. And that, that, that number N is something like the game value that I'm talking about, except I'm going to take it transfinite. Um, and the point is that white can always reduce that game value by playing. White can always make it go down by at least one. In fact, by exactly one. And black can never increase the value. And so what we end up with is, a, is an infinite descending sequence of ordinals. It must eventually hit zero. And those are the, the positions where, uh, where you've gotten the open winning condition. So that ordinal is measuring somehow the distance away from a win for the open player. So let me just kind of illustrate how this works. So suppose we had a game with a game value of omega squared. Then I claim if there's a game value, the open player is going to win that game. If it's Black's turn to play, then uh, 
then at, because it's a limit ordinal, they're going to in effect have to move to some position with some smaller ordinal value as large as they want, less than omega squared. So they have to pick some ordinal below omega squared. And for example, maybe they pick omega times three plus seven. And then white can make it go down by one and, and black and at a successor ordinal black can keep it the same. And so it's gonna go down eventually, it'll take 17 moves to get down to omega times three, which is another limit ordinal. But it's black to play now. And, uh, and so black has to pick some ordinal smaller than omega times three. For example, omega two plus 2014. I should have changed that to 2020. I guess you can tell where this slide came from a while back. Okay, um, so, uh, and now it's gonna take 2014 moves until they get down to this omega times two ordinal. And then black has to pick a smaller ordinal than omega times two. And, uh, and so maybe they pick omega plus 10 to the 100. That's a number that's smaller. And now the game is gonna go for 10 to the 100 many moves before it gets down to omega. And now black gets to pick again a, a number less than omega, any number. And, uh, and maybe they play say Graham's number, which if you've ever heard of it is this enormous number that's so mind bogglingly huge, but it's still finite. And so then the game would proceed in that many moves eventually down to zero at which time white would win. So the way it works is if a position has a game value, then that player, the open player is going to win, but black basically controls how long it takes. And that's the program here of this infinite chess. I wanna show you infinite chess positions. Let me just skip that slide. I I'd like to show you infinite chess positions that have very high game value. And so these are positions where white is definitely gonna win, white can force a win, but black is controlling how long it takes. Okay, now, okay, infinite chess. We don't really, we don't sit down in a cafe and play infinite chess, that's not what it's about. It's about thinking about what it would be like to play from this position or from that position. Okay, so we don't actually play it, we think about what it would be like to play it. Okay, so we have an infinite edgeless chessboard. It's like the integer lattice, there's no boundary. We have all the familiar pieces and they move as you would expect. There's no standard starting configuration. And also there's no standard number of pieces. So sometimes there's gonna be infinitely many pieces so there's gonna be 27 white light square bishops or something and that's completely fine. The game proceeds by setting up a position and saying, what would it be like to play from here? Okay, so that's how it works. Checkmate, when it occurs, does so after finally many moves. So it's an open game. And therefore we get the whole theory of those game values. It kicks in because it's an open game. And the project is, as I said, to describe positions that realize various large ordinal game values. So, okay, here's a position. We've got a white queen and rook. There's a white king here and a black king here, and it's white to move. So what is the game value? Um, can anyone suggest a good move for white? I think I would want to push the, the black king toward the white king. So I'd probably move the queen, you know, underneath maybe that. If you move the queen here, then the king is maybe going to run away or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can push the king all around. It's, he's going to run away. It's maybe going to be hard to trap him. What you want to do, I think, is trap the black king against the white king. It's like a kind of wall here. So, so in fact, if you do this, then it's check and you're protecting each other. And there's only one move for black, which is to run. This is called a roller. And, uh, and then white can can check again and it's protected. And so there's only one move for black. And then you check again. And you can just push the black king like this. It's just the same pattern over you're rolling the black king. Eventually, now the king goes there. And now this is checkmate because the king can't move anymore because you've pushed him into the wall. And that takes exactly 13 moves. And you can argue that you can't do it in 12 
and I'm counting the moves for just one player. That's what they do in chess. When you say made in 13, then you mean 13 moves for the one player. So maybe, you know, 25 moves altogether, right? So, okay, so the game value of this position is, is 13. Uh, you can argue that 12 is not gonna work. Um, okay, so here's a position I claim it has infinite game value. And that means white is going to win. White can force a win, but black can make it take as long as he wants. That's what value omega means. Black gets to pick any number and say, well, I know you're gonna win, but this time it's gonna take you a thousand moves, or this time it's gonna take you, you know, 10 billion moves, or this time, it's, you know, black can say any number. So if you look at this position, of course, white is threatening, is threatening lots of checkmates. If the queen goes here, it's checkmate. If the rook goes there, it's checkmate. So there's not a whole lot black can do. If black tries to threaten the queen or something, then white can just checkmate immediately, basically. Yeah. There's really only one thing to do, and that is just get this rook, move it out of there as high as you can. For example, maybe you move it 10 billion squares high. Okay. And then what white can do is do the roller yeah, you know, that's check, and there's only one move for black. And that's check again, and check, and so on. And white can force the black king against the rook, and that's checkmate. And one can argue that this is the optimal play, that if you deviate from this, then uh, you're not gonna make checkmate faster. That's a complicated argument, and it's some, something like the nature of infinite chess is that one has to do some kind of chess reasoning to, to explore the whole tree is often quite difficult. So you need to argue that if you deviate from this main line, then there's no possibility of a faster checkmate happening. Um, okay, so that means this position has value omega. Um, let's look at, here's some other positions with value omega. Let me just show you, say this one here. So here, I mean that there's infinitely many pieces. This pattern just goes forever. The pawns keep going up. And on the left side of the board, it's totally empty except for this black pawn. We just have this black pawn here. White always goes up, by the way, and black pawns always go down. Um, uh, so the black king is here totally locked up, and these pawns just continue forever. Now, if white were able to take this rook, then white could advance the pawn and deliver checkmate with this rook here. So, so black should move his rook up maybe, you know, a Google number of steps. And then what will happen is white will capture it from the side. And then white will move, there'll be a little hole in the armor. And then white can move those pawns up one after the other. And it will take a Google number of steps, but eventually these pawns will be able to move out of the way and this rook will be able to move up one and deliver checkmate. So that's why it has game value omega because black is going to lose, but black controls how long it takes by the height that they move the rook up. Okay, now here's a position with value omega squared. Um, okay, and again, I mean this pattern continues. So this wall of pawns continues upward forever, and this wall of pawns down continues downward forever. And so it's dividing the board into these two halves. And the kings are on this half with just this black rook. It's not enough to to check anybody. I mean, you can check, but you can't get checkmate on this king here. Um, and then on this side, there's this uh, horde of queens here. They would really love to come through the door, but the door is closed and there's no way to open it at first. But of course, white could capture this rook and move the pawns out of the way and then get the bishop out and then open the door and the queens would come in. And so, uh, but black doesn't want to allow that. And so what happens is black moves the rook up very, very high, 10 billion miles. Okay, and then white captures it. Okay, and now if we were doing the other pattern, then it would just take, you know, 10, 10 billion miles of pawns moving up and then eventually the thing would come up. But black has another trick. Every time white moves a pawn, then black says check. This is checking the white king. 
And so white has to answer that, has to move out of the way. Okay, but then black can do it again, check. And so white has to answer that. Okay, but now, now black's in trouble because uh, uh, white's gonna take this black rook and then that trick is gonna be over. So white should just move very far away, a billion miles away. Okay, I mean, I just had it move six, but uh, imagine it's moving very far because of course we have the whole infinite board. We can move as far as we want. And now white has a chance to say, ah, whoosh, uh, now I can move a pawn over there because I'm trying to get these pawns moved up so that I can open the door so that the queens can come in, right? And black says, well, you move that pawn up, sure, but now check. And white says, well, gosh, I better move out of the way. And white can't just move out of the way forever and allow himself to be checked over and over infinitely because white wants to win, not just be checked forever. That's a draw. So white has to chase down the rook in order to stop this checking from happening. Yeah, and then at that moment, black moves now 10 trillion miles away. Okay, as far away as you want. And then white says, Woof, I finally get to move another pawn. Okay, and black says, well, that's good, but check. Okay, and then this, this same pattern again, check, 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 check. And then when the white king catches up, then black has to move away and that's not a threat move. And that's when white is gonna be able to advance another pawn. I just moved the rook back, but black should never move towards the thing. You should always move further out, but I couldn't draw it on here. So just imagine that black moved even further away. Um, so then on the moves, when black moves far away, white is advancing uh, a pawn in the wall and then black, does this harassing, checking, check, 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 check. Okay, and then moves far away. Finally, white gets to move uh, something out of the way because we can move the bishop out of the way. So we're still aiming to open this door. And then it's check, 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 check. Black moves away. Now white has a free chance to make progress on opening the door. And then check, 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 check. Uh, harassing the king. It's of no consequence, but it takes a long time, right? And uh, then what black has to move again, further to the right, we should imagine. And then the door opens, but black can still do this checking and white has to answer it. Um, and then uh, now white can come in with check, the doors open and the queens are gonna come in and that's checkmate. So that has value omega squared because the initial rook move going up is basically choosing a, is making an announcement about how many times black is gonna make another announcement. And each of these rooks moving out is an announcement about how many moves there will be before uh, the next announcement is made. And so the initial black rook going up is a what I call a large announcement. And moving these rooks out is a small announcement. The small announcement is basically saying, I'm gonna have that many moves on you before you get to do anything more. And then after that, I'm gonna make another announcement. And the large announcement is the number of small announcements that get to be made because that's measuring how many times the pawns have to go up. Okay, so here's a, an improvement on that. I wanna make sure, let's see what time. Okay, this is a similar thing where we have uh, four of those rook towers chained together, okay? The other one had only one rook tower, but the pattern of play is similar. So there's this initial threat that the king is here to be checkmated and then it's gonna be captured. And then there's this harassing region here. So check, 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 it's harassing. And every time it's the, the white king is, is, is almost taking, then black has to move away. And that's when white gets a chance to make progress in the main line, you know? And then it's harassing, 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 check, 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 and then black has to move away, and then more progress, and so on, check, 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 okay, I'm sorry, uh, and then more progress, and so on. And so what you can see is happening is uh, uh, white is making progress on that rook tower that is similar to before. Now the bishops are now here, the bishops are going to move out of the way, and then come up, and it's going to then activate the next rook tower. So that pawn is coming up from the bottom. 
Okay, boy, this is taking a long time. So it tells you why we don't actually play infinite chess. We just think about what it would be like to play infinite chess. So, okay, then, then the, there's a capture here, which is now threatening this one. And black doesn't want that to be captured because then it's like moving up only one square or zero squares instead of 10 billion squares, which is what black would do in order to have even more announcements. Um, and so that goes up. And, and then again, you can see that the harassing will happen uh, again here and, and the white um, will eventually mass once. Eventually the, 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 that second column is used up and then the play passes the third one and the fourth one and so on. And then eventually checkmate is delivered on the black team. Okay. We had a request. Is there anything you can say topologically about this game? Topologically? Oh, I never, let's see, I'm not sure what they would have, what the person would have in mind with that. Um, uh, I mean, the chess board is like Z cross Z, which is, of course, one can imagine other kinds of boards like on a, on a cylinder or something like that, which would be topologically a different board. Um, and some people have thought a little bit about that. And also later on, I'm going to talk, well, I don't know if we'll have time, but about three dimensional chess. So that's topologically different. But most of the analysis is just on the integer lattice, uh, the two-dimensional integer lattice, because it, I don't know, we sort of felt that's the most chess-like of any of the infinite um, configurations. Okay. Yeah, and, and then there's the, I mean, we already talked about the topology of the moves, that's a tree. And then there's the topology created by the, the pieces. Oh, I see. Uh, because of the, um, well, I guess the, right. I mean, the, the possible moves, the, the tree has a topology and, open games are open in the product topology. That's why they're called open games. Um, uh, so, but I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I have much to say about, about that question. So this is a position that, that Corey Evans and I made with the uh, value omega three, and it's just uh, omega cubed. It's similar to the other one, which had four rook columns, but now we have infinitely many. And the point is that on the first move, um, the black bishop here is under attack and this bishop is going to go out and be captured, and then the pawns are going to break through, and that's going to, in effect, activate one of the rook towers. And then we're going to, the transfer of, of control will go to the previous one, previous one, previous one, previous one. And of course, every pawn movement up there is involving an enormous harassing round here. And so each tiny little bit of progress in these rook towers um, is, is interrupted by, you know, uh, arbitrarily large uh, harassing rounds happening in the, in the team harassment area. But eventually those pawns are going to get advanced and then the next rook is going to be attacked and that one's going to go up and so on. And so each rook is going up as a large announcement. This bishop here is a huge announcement because the bishop is telling you how many rook towers you can use. If you have four towers, that was omega squared times four. If you have 17 towers, that's omega squared times 17. And so overall, this position is going to be omega cubed because black can control how many rook towers there are going to be in effect. Uh, and so we got up to omega cubed this way. Now, and so people are asking what's possible. Yeah, great. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. We don't know. It's an open question. But let me tell you the current best value, which is omega to the fourth. And this is the position. Um, it's sort of hard to see, but I'm going to show you sort of blown up versions. This is the throne room. The kings are here, the white king and the black king. This is a, a rook tower arrangement, which was very similar to the omega cubed arrangement. And down here, which was the innovation of Norman Perlmutter, is the, uh, the bishop cannon battery. So these are the bishop cannons here. And they get arbitrarily big. This is a, a three cannon and a four cannon and a five cannon and so on. And for every N, there's an N cannon. And these are the, uh, the, the things that the cannons are aiming at. The bishops are going to come into to these and they're going to be making lots of threats. And there's a, one of these things of each possible finite size. Okay, so let me tell you how it works. This is the throne room. It's totally locked up. But if a white bishop were to land on this red diagonal, it would be checkmate. And if a black bishop were to land on the blue diagonal and then enter, then in three moves, it would be checkmate against the white king. So black is 
three moves behind white as far as the throne room is concerned, which is an important thing. This is the rook tower arrangement. And it's similar here, this black bishop is gonna come out, that's gonna activate as many rook towers as they want. And white is ultimately aiming to push these pawns up in these rook towers so that transfer of control moves to the next rook tower. Each time a rook tower is used, black gets to move the rook up as high as they want, which is a, 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 a kind of announcement about how many pawns motions there's gonna be. And then with each pawn motion, black is going to employ the bishop cannon. Yeah, and the bishop cannon, the way it works is that uh, there's these bishops lined up and they can be fired out here. And the first bishop to come out is not, a, is not an immediate threat. Um, and that's when white gets to advance a pawn in the rook tower. So when the first bishop comes out, that doesn't have to be answered immediately. And white can say, finally, I can make a move up in my, in my rook tower. But now the next time the bishops come out, it's an immediate threat because if this bishop comes out, then if white doesn't answer, then the black pawn can descend and puncture a hole in the wall here. Uh, and it's gonna release some other black bishops, which can then go immediately to the throne room and give checkmate. And so black, I mean, white has to shore up the wall. If this bishop here is fired, then white has to advance this pawn in order to protect this one so that these other black bishops can't leak out. Okay, and then this is what we call the bishop gateway terminal. So the bishops, when they get fired out of the cannon, they're gonna align themselves to enter one of these things, sort of like an airplane, like an airport wing, a long hallway with these gates. And as many gates as you want, you can fire your bishop out and then line yourself up with a, with a gateway that has 10 gates or 100 or a billion or however many you want. Um, and the point is that every time the black bishop can come in and occupy one of these squares, it's a threat that must be answered immediately. Because if white doesn't answer it here immediately, then the bishop can escape one step ahead of what's necessary in order for white uh, to prevent the checkmate. So what happens is the bishop comes in and makes the threat and white just answers the threat. And then the bishop makes the next threat and white just answers that threat. And, and so the bishop can use up all those threats depending on the length of this airport gateway. Okay, so then, okay, the overall pattern of play is, is that uh, this bishop comes out, which activates a certain number of rook towers, and, uh, and then black makes threats. It's basically all of this bishop stuff is a replacement for the simple-minded harassment. The simple-minded harassment was just a rook harassing a king, and that's just an omega level harassment. This bishop cannon is basically an omega squared level of harassment because black can choose a cannon and fire it, and then that's when the pawn moves up here, but then black has n cannons, n bishops in that cannon, each one of which must be answered immediately, and then each one of those things can line itself up with any of the gateways as big as desired and make that many threats. So black can say, look, I've got, I'm gonna have 17 bishops and each of them is gonna make a move which uh, can be arbitrarily large and you have to answer every single step of that before you get to move again up in that rook tower. Okay, I don't know if that was understandable, but it's an omega squared level of harassment and this by itself was omega squared. And so we get omega to the fourth altogether, altogether. Okay, so then, um, right. Let me go on to this computability part. I don't know how much time we have left. I see, About just three minutes. Part. Okay, so let me just mention some computability issues. Um, so let me go to the made and end problem. Um, okay, so the question is, Given a position in infinite chess, can you computably decide what the optimal play is? In finite chess, that's a solvable problem in principle because the game tree is finite and you can in principle perform the back propagation method on the game tree and determine the winner. And that's essentially how a lot of the chess programs used to work, search in the game tree. I mean, now of course with alpha, um, uh, the, the 
current chess programs are, are not exactly just searching the game tree, they're doing other things. Also, one has to prune the game tree because the game tree even of chess is just too big even to fit in the universe uh, using every single atom. Uh, and so there's no way to actually implement the search in the game tree algorithm. You have to prune the tree um, even in principle. Okay, but I wanna know, given a finite position, can, can, can you computably decide um, whether one of the players can win in n moves, given n and a position, decide if you can win in n moves. And for example, here's a position, and I say, well, can you force a win in 12 moves? This is the position we looked at earlier. Um, and if you're naive about it, then uh, the maiden n problem looks to be very, very complicated because you're asking, I mean, made in three means there is a white move so that for every reply, there is a white move so that for every reply, there is a white move that delivers checkmate. That's a sigma five assertion. We don't expect those kind of assertions to be computable. Um, so the arithmetic complexity is very, very high for these uh, things in infinite chess. It looks like maybe it shouldn't be decided. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, it is decidable. Uh, and this was proved by Brumlevy, myself, and Philip Schlicht. So we proved that the maiden n position, the maiden n problem for infinite, I mean, sorry, for finite positions in infinite chess is computably decidable. Um, and the way that we did it was we were able to interpret the problem in what's called Pressburg arithmetic, this structure. Every such problem reduces to a question about the integers with addition and less than. And this is well known to be a decidable theory. And what was important in that was that bishops and queens and rooks move on straight lines whose equations can be expressed in this arithmetic. If there were a zebra or an elephant or something that moved on a parabola, then it would completely break this proof. Uh, and we wouldn't know if, it, if infinite chess is decidable in that case. Um, now, this is for the maiden n problem, but remember there are positions that white can definitely win, but they're not maiden n for any n. A position with value omega or higher, are, those positions are winning positions for white. White has a winning strategy, but they're not maiden n for any n because black can make it take as long as they want, even though it's black is doomed. Um, and so it doesn't answer this question, is the winning position problem computably decidable? This is an open question, and it was asked on Math Overflow by Richard Stanley. Um, and this was the question actually that motivated my whole interest in infinite chess, and we started looking at it after that. And uh, I have no idea how to answer this question, and um, if anyone has any ideas, I would love to uh, talk to you about it. So why don't I stop there, and I'm happy to have any kind of questions, so please, uh, Feel free to ask. We can unmute and clap. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> we have 30 seconds for one question before we stop the recording, and then we can hang around until Joel falls asleep. <laughs> Well, okay, I'll ask my earlier one. It's not obvious to me that chess is finite. Like, not that I understand the rules well enough, but just that we outlaw three move loops, why does that outlaw all infinite sequences of play? Or do we have to also have the 50 move rule for chess to be okay. finite? Let's see, so there's the 50 move rule. I think if you don't have that, let's see. Uh, well, the, the threefold repetition, just by itself forces the game tree to be finite, right? Because, I mean, there's only, there's only finitely many states of the board. And, and so you can visit each of them at most twice before the game is over. According okay. To the rule, right? So, but actually the official rule at some tournaments is that if you repeat three times, it doesn't mean necessarily the game is over if the other player doesn't ask for it. Right. So, I mean, it means that either player has the right to ask for the draw, but it's not automatically a draw if they want to keep playing. Right. And so that's a sense in which the game tree could be infinite. Um, so, right. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But. Well, 
I think it's time for us to stop our recording. So let's clap one more time. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to be here. Right. So um, real quick before I shut off the recording, uh, just a quick advertisement for next week. Uh, Andrew Stacy will be giving a talk on From Clocks to Categories. Andrew, are you still with us today? Do you want to give a 30 second? Sorry, I just had to unmute. Um, yeah, so From Clocks to Categories, um, how to find category theory. Well, the maths part will be how to find category theory in um, school mathematics. And I hope also to sort of provoke a little bit of thinking about how the relationship between school maths and academic maths can, uh, I don't know, improve? Is that the right word? Um, and we can talk to each other a little bit more. All right.